Hey guys, welcome back. Um, I made a video on a car here, and um, I actually spent a whole lot of time going through it. Um, as far as you know, taking my time on the video, I was trying to do something really good because this car was pretty interesting, um, and I uh, deleted the footage. Uh, I was ready to give up, and I decided that I was going to try one more time but I was gonna do it a little different. I was just gonna kind of talk about what we had. So this is not gonna be a diagnostic video per se, but I wanna go through the process of what we did here because I think it's interesting, especially that this is an older vehicle. Uh, the lesson will carry over to new vehicles, so it doesn't really matter. As far as that goes, it's a drivability issue and uh, things have to be right. An engine, you know, an internal combustion engine is you know, it's all basically the same, it carries over. So, first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to thank a friend of mine because a buddy of mine, uh, maybe a month or two ago, was in here with a, a nightmare of a intermittent issue with a twin turbo Ford, Ford Exped, uh, Explorer. And uh, it turned out to be an issue caused by the dealer and we fixed it and uh, he brought me a gift. <laughs> it's pretty freaking cool. I, <laughs> I've never owned one of these. It's the old snap-on brick, uh, the uh, MT2500. I've honestly never owned one. It came, he brought it to me. It's almost like brand new in the case. Um, and he said he has no use for it. He's like, I'm sure you could put it to use. And he gave it to me, which was really, really cool and really, really amazing time. And so Troy, uh, Shannon, I thank you for that. Uh, very, very nice of you to do. Um, and it came in handy. I've actually used this a couple of times already for a couple of different older vehicles, OBD1 cars, and it, you know, it works fantastic. It's like, it is like brand new, so this is, that was really cool. And it came into play with this, uh, with this Corvette that I have here. It's an 88 VET. I'll, I'll show you guys the car, what we got. All right. Uh, nothing unfamiliar to most of you guys. It's, uh, you know, it's a wedge with, uh, some tires on it. Anyway, uh, what's the story with the car? Well, the complaint on this thing was that it ran really bad when you first started the car up. Uh, it wouldn't stay running. It, it got worse since these guys owned it. And the thing with the car, the history behind this car is it was sold to this gentleman uh, who's a friend of a friend, okay? Actually, the guy who's, uh, his, the guy who's friends with me is actually my former boss and the former owner of Joe's Electric. You've heard me talk about him before. Uh, now that he's retired, he didn't, you know, obviously want to get involved working on this thing. He doesn't want to work on them anymore. And uh, he told his buddy that, you know, send it to me and we'll take a look at it. This has been, he, this car is, uh, I'm trying to think, he bought it probably about a year ago. So he's been going through this with this car since day one. It's never ran right. It's never been uh, easy to start. It's always given him fits. It, it, was, it was doing all kinds of craziness when you tried to start it. It was popping through the intake. It was backfiring. It was shutting off. It was, it was just a mess. You couldn't keep it idling. Then once it warmed up a little while, it would run a little better and it was drivable. And he finally got it down here uh, just in time for the heater core to be leaking all over the place. And uh, <clears throat> and this is the this is the old core and it was actually dripping out of here and the carpet under the carpet was soaked um, this was a fiasco as, as always trying to get parts and you know it's always fun working on a Corvette under the dashboard so before I went too crazy checking anything on here. Uh, I really didn't want to run it with low coolant all the time and start playing with, you know, with that. So I made some tests. The first thing I wanted to do was let it sit overnight. I actually wanted to see this thing act up. And uh, that's what I did. So I let it, I, I started it cold in the morning and boy, let me tell you, this thing ran bad. It wouldn't start. It was chugging. It was shutting off. It was everything you could think of spitting under the sun. It was just terrible. Uh, so we did some obvious visual inspections on the car and I noticed some stuff that caught my eye like right off the top of my head right 
So right off the top, the first thing I noticed was this is uh, loose. It's actually not loose, it's broke. One, one, was, uh, one was tight, the other one was completely stripped, side, you know, completely uh, cross-threaded. So I started by looking there. Um, you know, I, I saw that, I was like, well, somebody was tampering. Obviously they were in here. And if you couldn't get three bolts back in place that were right there, Without doing damage, uh, it always makes me question who was working on the car. Uh, the other thing I noticed is this is supposed to have two studs that hold these, uh, the air filter box in place. It only has one. The other one's begun. Uh, no stud, no nothing. Um, a number of things that I noticed on the car that just didn't, you know, just didn't seem right. The connector here for the set timing this is the set timing connector. You would disconnect this to put it into base time on these models, and then you would check your timing and drive, and it's supposed to be six degrees. I noticed this was taped into the harness, never touched. That is an indication that whoever was in here playing never actually disconnected that timing connector or looked for it to set the timing. So what's the, what am I getting at? Well, I'm getting at, when you do a visual inspection on a car, and you see things like that, it, it, it gives you hints towards what they might have touched, uh, what they might have screwed up, you know, whatever the case, right? Uh, the other thing I want to show you, this is the mass air meter off this vehicle. I'm trying to make sure that this will focus in. And if it does, you can read the name brand on there. All right, the original uh, mass air meter on this car was a Bosch. And I wasn't aware of this early, I wasn't aware of this until recently, but I was speaking to a gentleman from, uh, uh, from Automotive Training Solutions actually. And we were, we were just talking. And uh, he, he was telling me that these Bosch units were actually used on BMWs from back years ago. Uh, this is the system that has the mass airflow burn off relay and it activates the burn off relay when you shut the car off in order to uh, burn off any kind of debris that may be caught on the filament, so, you know, the hot wire. So, um, in any case, I'm, I'm familiar with these systems, but I did not know that it was a BMW or European design uh, until recently. So anyway, not that it makes a difference, it doesn't either here or there. Uh, as usual, I'm getting off track. What I'm getting at is, this car was tampered with. This problem was existent when he bought the vehicle from this other gentleman, and that tells you they were trying to fix this car. Unsuccessfully, right? So they changed parts, and they did not find the root cause of the issue, and I guess they gave up and, and you know, gave up on the vehicle, they sold it. So now, now that we got our hands on it, now we have to verify things, we have to verify what's good, right? And find out what's bad on the car. So the heater core is broke, that's easy. That's you know easy as far as it's visibly broke, it's leaking. So pull that apart, put the heater core in it. Uh, I did some testing on the airflow and found that the airflow was not working properly. Um, something I wanna talk about guys is that it's important is fuel trims. And I'm actually very surprised that there's, uh, there's still so many techs out there that are unfamiliar with using fuel trims for diagnosis. Um, it's, it's one of the most powerful things you can use for drivability and one of the most obvious things you can look at for um, understanding whether the car is rich, lean, if it has fuel control, you know, whatever. Uh, people obviously don't utilize it. A lot of people don't utilize it. Maybe they don't understand it, but uh, if you don't, and if you're one of those guys that don't, does not understand it, I, I suggest you seriously take a class on fuel trims and how they work. This is not going to be that video, but I'm going to explain certain, a couple of things. Uh, years ago, on these models, on these cars, they used the fuel trims uh, were called block learn and integrator. Your long term was the block learn, your integrator is the short term. Okay, for those guys who are familiar with, you know, the newer OBD2 cars. Now, on the newer vehicles, 
long-term, short-term fuel trim, you're looking for zero or thereabouts, right? So zero is perfect, perfect air fuel. If you do not have zero, you have, I mean, well, if you have somewhere that's, you know, minus 10, plus 10, and above or below, you have something going on with the car. It's rich or it's lean. So if it's minus, it's lean, and it's pulling, if it's minus, rather, it's pulling fuel out, so it's rich, okay? Anything negative is that computer is pulling fuel. Anything positive, it's adding fuel, so that means that it's a lean condition. If you can understand that, you're halfway there, okay, to getting to, to diagnose these. With this car, it doesn't work that way. If you have zero fuel trims on this car, <laughs> the car ain't running. Uh, these cars are 128 is the, is the magic number to make it stoke, right? So it's perfect. Uh, anything below 128, and it's like it's minus zero, okay? Anything above 128, it's positive. It's above zero. So the same rules apply. Minus, below 128, it's, it's pulling fuel. Above, it's adding. With this car, I noticed right away that the fuel trims were about 155, 160. It was adding a ton of fuel. I also noticed the O2 sensor was doing absolutely nothing. So I started to check. I went to my O2. I wanted to put a, I wanted to get a scope uh, signal at the O2. And when I went to the O2 sensor, immediately I noticed that it was loose in the pipe. So somebody had changed it and they put a cheap, it looked like a really cheap junk O2 in it. And they never tightened it. I mean, they didn't even crush the washer on it. It was, it was just very loose in the pipe. They have to be tight. That's where it gets a ground. Uh, it grounds through the exhaust, and if it doesn't have that, it's not going to function properly. Seeing that it was a junk O2, and knowing this guy wants the car running right, uh, for $22 or whatever the new Delco unit was, I bought one, and uh, I installed it uh, just as a fail-safe thing. The O2 has to work right in this car. So I put one in. They're cheap enough. They're, uh, you know, it's not worth playing with a cheap unit. In any case, we continued on and found that, uh, as I said, our fuel trims were still high. They're still 155. Uh, the O2 now would respond, however, if I added fuel to the system. You would see the jump in the O2. And that's telling me now at least that the O2 is not lying to me, right? So the next, the next thing that I did on the car was start going through uh, my testing on the airflow again, which I know the airflow on this thing was not working properly either. Uh, I found that it was obviously a Spectre unit. It's junk, uh, cheap. They threw this in there trying to fix the problem with the car. It did not fix it. The distributor on the car was flopping in the breeze. It was loose. They never tightened the, uh, they never tightened the fastener on it. And, the, you know, when I checked the timing, it was like 22, deg 22 degrees before top dead center. Uh, I set the timing, the base timing correctly, re relearned the idle, or attempted to, but the car would run like crap. Uh, the timing didn't fix the car. Uh, but I put it at six degrees where it belongs. It helped it start better, but it was still, once it started, it was, you know, all over the place. Trims were crazy. I got an airflow, I put it in, and I noticed something. With the new airflow, it went from 155 down to 138. It's not right, but it's a lot better. And the trims were still skewing, you know, up and down a little bit. They, w they weren't right, but they were better. And I was like, well, all right, well, that airflow is definitely not working properly, but I'm going to put it on the side for now and go further because what I noticed is that now with the new airflow in, not with the old one, with the new airflow, when I would race the throttle up, actually, I should have said this before, when I, when I, when I had checked for, I thought I had a vacuum leak, I increased the RPM in the car off idle. And what I noticed is that the fuel trims didn't change. They didn't try to correct. So I was like, okay. So I put an airflow in it. Now when I raced it up with the new airflow, the trims actually do correct. They go to 128, they immediately correct. So I was like, this thing definitely has a leak. No doubt has a leak. Uh, Smoke test it, easy enough, right? Go to our, uh, go to our mass airflow boot, right? Our intake boot, pop this off, put a bladder in it, and smoke test it. Well, there were no leaks. It's to my surprise, no leaks anywhere. So I was like, oh boy. Um, 
at that point I decide I'm going to go old school on this thing and I'm going to start blocking off vacuum lines just in case it's an internal leak. Check the PCV, no help. I went to the booster, blocked this off and, my, and the car nearly showed off. It actually stumbled so bad as the trims dropped to 90, <laughs> okay? Uh, so at that point we obviously knew we had a problem with the booster. I was actually pretty surprised because there was no smoke coming out. But I, what I did was I put the hose back I ran the car for a few minutes and I started to spray very lightly with brake clean around the booster. And when I got to the back side of the booster, the car just started to shake and stumble and the trims were, you know, going, ne you know, going negative. So I was like, wow, this thing is definitely leaking, but it's not showing anything with a smoke machine. So be aware of that, guys. That's part of the, part of the thing here. Uh, you're not always going to find it with smoke. Um, <laughs> and when I show you this, Right now, you're going to be very surprised if I could find it myself. There it is. Take a look right here. See it? Huge crack all the way down. Okay? And this is on the back side of the booster. And it was, where was the position on this guy? Uh, This way, yeah, this way. It was like this. Nope, my bad, my fault. It was actually facing this way, so it was against the firewall. Okay, it was actually facing like this, so it was against the firewall where this leak was. You couldn't see it, you know, visibly. And uh, here's our new one. Okay, so. There's the new one. It was behind here, the crack, you know, in the back here. So you really couldn't see anything. Of course, after I put the booster on, me being myself, I have to pull the old, the new airflow off and put the old one back on and see what numbers I got. And um, I got numbers of 160, 155, 160 on the fuel trims. So this thing needed, this thing probably originally, or definitely originally needed a booster. This thing's been broke for a long time. They threw an airflow at it. They started playing with distributor timing and, uh, you know, O2 sensors and everything they touched on the car was either loose or damaged. So, uh, in the end, understanding the trims and understanding one test, you know, to the next, that's where you want to go to diagnose the car. You know what I mean? You don't want to just start changing parts or playing with things without knowing. Don't just move a distributor. You know, check the timing, put a light on it, see what's going on, do, do it the right way. Uh, just as a side note with this car, when we did check it originally, I had my scope hooked up, my amp clamp around the two injector drivers. This is a bank fire system. So I was monitoring all of my injectors on current and I wanted to see if this thing had a shorted injector because these did do that pretty commonly. Uh, just the basics, cover the basics. Uh, you know, in the end, it's kind of it's kind of sucky because uh, if the car would have come to a professional before, you know me or whoever, the the knew how to test, they would have found the vacuum leak as soon as they saw the fuel trims on the car. They would have known what to do. Obviously, if they had any experience, they would have checked the booster as one of the things when they didn't see an obvious leak, and they would have replaced the booster and fixed the car, and it would still have the original Bosch sensor in place, which would have been better. Um, you know, and none of this other stuff would have been tampered with and damaged. But as it turns out, the guy apparently um, tried to fix the car himself and gave up after he spent some money on junk parts and he sold it. So now that this gentleman has it, uh, hopefully we got this thing to where it is running very well. So. This car, remember, remember though, this car does still have to be driven, it has to relearn, but the fuel trims are right, everything is working uh, as it should, and uh, the only, well, I shouldn't say that actually, the steering shaft on the car needs to be replaced, so there's a knuckle down here, you can see that, I don't know how well you're going to see it, but 
There's a steering knuckle down there that needs to be changed out. That joint is no good. But that's a fix, and we're going to uh, we're going to get this thing back to the customer as soon as I get the roof back on it, and uh, that'll be the end of that, hopefully. But yeah, uh, I gotta drive it as soon as I, God help me, I hate getting in these cars, but as soon as I get the roof back on this thing, um, take it for a ride maybe tomorrow and just verify that, it, you know, I get it to relearn and do what it's gotta do, but, uh, but overall that's it. This car was a workout. Everything on here is very difficult to do, except for the mass airflow, actually. That's the easiest thing in the world to change, but heater core was a pain in the, uh, you know what, so, is what it is. The booster's not terrible. It's a little bit of work under the dash part. There's only two bolts that hold it, so um, a little finicky to get back in. Nothing crazy. Definitely done worse, but uh, that's it, guys. I thought maybe you'd enjoy this. I really wish that I had the, the information saved where I had scan data and all the other stuff that I could have showed you, but hopefully next time I don't hit the button like a meathead and delete it. I'll see you guys soon.